Hello, everyone, and thanks for tuning in to the Functional Fighters podcast. In a moment, you're going to hear the intro to our show, and you're going to hear us say the wrong name. Uh, that's because just before we published the very first episode, we found out somebody else beat us to the punch. Pun fully intended. So we needed to find a new name. And since we're overachievers, we had recorded several episodes before we discovered this. So we will have it fixed a few episodes in. We live, we learn, and now on with the show. Hello, world. I'm Dan McCarthy. And I'm Brian Basaga. And welcome to another edition of Striking Thoughts. For those of you who are just joining us, this is a podcast about uh, martial arts and modern society as it relates to self-defense and practical application. Cover a lot more than that over time, but that's always our lens. Yeah, so today's topic in particular is we're going to talk about martial arts traditions. Um, and what we want to look at is, are some of these traditions good or are they bad through that lens of, of self-defense and, you know, modern day aspects? Some of them uh, very well might still uh, have value to the modern day self-defense practitioner. And some of them just might be dumb and it might be a little bit fun for us to look at and just kind of see, you know, where did they come from and why are we still doing them? And uh, Brian, why don't you go ahead and, and lead us off here? Absolutely. Yeah, that's a big topic. I think this kind of touches on a lot of just where society is at in general in terms of what, what from the past is good and what from the past should stay there. And, um, and, and we'll have a lot to say on that, I'm sure. So, I'll throw the first one out. I think when, when I think of martial arts traditions, the first one I think of is bowing, right? So we come in, different schools do it differently. I know uh, a lot of schools, you bow to come in, you know, onto the mat, you bow to the instructor, you bow to your partner, you bow out at the end of class. There's a, just a lot of bowing going on. So what do you think about that one, Dan? Well, um, I think that, as a general rule, in some way, shape, or form, if you're going to be putting hands on, on each other, I think that respect is seriously important. Um, I also think that if you have self-respect and you have respect for other human beings, you're probably less likely to end up in a street fight. Um, so I, I kind of feel like the, the martial arts respect tradition, be it a bow or a handshake or something like that, still has a lot of uh, weight to today's world, even though it may not be something that is directly translatable into like a street self-defense situation. Maybe maybe if you carry that kind of respect in your heart, it might you know keep you out of something like that, potentially. Yeah, you know? sure. That's an excellent point. I think it, it certainly can. You know, bowing is certainly a sign of respect and, uh, you know, ultimately beyond that i think it's a sign of commitment right like it's a contract between you and your partner and you and your instructor in terms of what's about to happen right and how yeah. you're going to treat each other how you deal with each other i think in my opinion i think there's even a more valuable aspect to bowing than that and i think it it's a mental cue right it's a focuser right so it's um you know you bow on that mat or you bow at the beginning of class to your instructor that that's like your mental indicator that all right you know social time is over focus time has begun right, right? it's time to really get into it yes exactly and uh it just gets you helps you if you're using it in that way right it helps to get you into the right um, mentality to train and train safely pay attention to what you're doing um you know, martial arts class has always been a social thing for me. I mean, like, I made a lot of, what I said in one of the previous episodes, you know, I made a lot of great friends, lifelong friends through the martial arts. And, uh, and so there's definitely a social aspect to it. But that's not those 45 minutes or hour or whatever it is that you're on the floor with your instructor. Bowing tells you when that starts and when that ends. That's a really good point. That is, that's a very good point. I like that. Yeah, I think um, it's one of those things you can kind of take with you outside of the dojo, too. It's like a little, you know, uh, 
you know, necessarily going to uh, bow to your work computer or, or whatever it is, you know, bow to your, uh, your vacuum cleaner or whatever, but you can use the same mental cue, right? Like, all right, I'm going to stop, center myself for one second, and now it is time to do, you know, X, Y, or Z, whatever it is I'm, I'm working on. You know, uh, one of uh, a, a mutual acquaintance of ours, uh, a former instructor of both of ours, I'll, who will remain nameless, um, used to say the same thing about like putting on the uniform and the belt, which I'll, I'll just kind of segue into that part of martial arts tradition here is he, he, he said the same thing about training with a uniform and a belt gives that focus, that ability to realize, okay, well, I'm putting on my, it's like, I'm putting on my work clothes time to go to work. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Now, the uniform one is, is another interesting one. I think we see particularly in, in self-defense oriented systems like these days a move away from the uniform or at least to a non-traditional uniform right like maybe a tactical pants you know and a, and a polo shirt or something like that seems to be pretty popular these days uh, my thoughts on that are you know um, I guess first I'll stop and say in my program we train with traditional martial arts uniforms so, uh, you know, uh, we do, um, my thoughts are that there are drawbacks to that, right? Like, um, if you follow the adage that says you should train, like you have to fight, right? You're never going to be wearing those types of clothes. You know what I mean? You're, you're not, right. I mean, unless you get in a self-defense situation on your way out of the dojo, right? You're not right. likely to be wearing your uniform anywhere else maybe on Halloween or something like that. And that's your kind of thing. Um, so there's definitely a disadvantage there. I think if you're wearing relaxed pants or even jeans or some kind of shirt that you, uh, you know, would wear in normal daily society, you'll understand how that may impact some of the things you want to do, some of the techniques you want to use. Um, so for me, I could kind of take or leave uniforms. Uh, now, the one major advantage and reason we still use them um, is we do a lot of like grabs, grappling, uh, attacking the clothes, and our students have traditionally been pretty well mixed. And like your average polo shirt or t-shirt, uh, you, you will see a few of those ripped off of people in, in general training in our system. You know, and, uh, we've got like you got a mixed group of people. You have men and women training together. Uh, it's, it's not great to be ripping t-shirts off of everybody. So you put a gi on and you got something nice and sturdy and you can train with it. So that that's kind of what leads us to continue to use it. Yeah, especially when you start looking at one of the um, higher quality ones. I mean, if you, if you go into a lot of uh, martial arts schools that um, you get your, your uniform at and all that kind of stuff, you might start off with something that's kind of cheap. Um, for those that don't know, you know, a, a standard student uniforms, like a six ounce uniform in terms of by weight. Um, whereas most of us who are in, really in the thick of it, and, and this isn't something we do once a week for a year and give up, it's become a lifelong passion. Uh, my, my uniform weighs twice that I wear a 12 ounce. Um, that's because I wear it for three hours a day, five days to six days a week. Um, and I don't want it to get wrecked. You know, I want it to be able to withstand the wear and tear. And if somebody grabs a hold of my lapel or they grab a hold of my sleeve and they yank on it, I don't want it to rip. And, and so that is definitely the, the benefit of continuing to use the traditional martial arts, uh, uniform. I mean, if you, if you can't make the leap of, well, you'll never wear this in the real world. Yeah, obviously. However, um, it, it doesn't feel all that different than wearing like a really good leather jacket. If you got a nice, really nice, good jacket, it, it kind of feels like wearing that gi in terms of the weight. So, you know, you could probably would be in a self-defense situation like that. And actually, this is a pretty funny story. I don't think I had an opportunity to tell you, but this will be a great one for our audience. Um, uh, over the winter before all the COVID-19 shut down, I had a self-defense situation in my uniform. Uh, because I literally had a drunk wander into my dojo in the middle of me teaching class and step right on the mat while I was teaching. Um, 
and I had to chase him out of out of my school in full view of all of my students and and the parents who were um, who were present. And uh, um, obviously, pe- most people listening to this podcast don't know anything about my business, but I'm located two doors down from a dollar theater. Um, and I noticed that this gentleman went over to the dollar theater. So when my class bowed out and my adults lined up, I looked at them and said, y'all just need to chill. I'll be right back. <laughs> so I went over to the, uh, I went over to the dollar theater cause I knew this guy had gone over there to do whatever. And I confronted him for, for doing that. So I absolutely was in a, a true self-defense situation in my martial arts uniform and you know, I'm. How do you get better than that? I was ready to go. I was warmed <laughs> up and in my gi and yeah. and everything. You know what I mean? <laughs> that was a fantastic situation. But obviously, that was like a million to one chance. I've been doing this stuff for thirty years, and that's the first time that's ever happened. And I've actually had probably seven or eight real world um, martial arts or potential fighting altercations in the real world. That's the only time it's ever involved a uniform. Yeah, that's strange. You know, another one that I can recall, this is ages ago. I was watching one of those police video type of shows and it had a surveillance camera footage of some guy who just started, uh, you know, assaulting some woman in broad daylight. You know, was I know exactly the video you're talking yeah, about. And it was right in front of like a martial arts studio where there was like a seminar going on. And like some guy walked right out there, you know, and just, uh, just, he, he, he nailed this guy right in like a sensitive spot on your neck and basically knocked him out with one shot. But yeah, so there's two examples of how uh, you could potentially be wearing your martial arts uniform. <laughs> In just not likely situation but uh, i think i think the next time something like that happens you should go buy a lottery ticket it's, uh, <laughs> yeah it's gonna be a long time before that happens again yeah so what do you think so what's the bottom line on this one here from the damn uniforms are they uh well you know i'm i mean basically like like you said, it's it's not like you're really gonna fight in it the the odds of that are 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 extremely improbable but i think there's still uh, I think there's a good reason to have good clothing that is of a utility factor when it comes to your training. It doesn't have to be um, a uniform, so to speak, but it should be um, something of that caliber of uh, of make. I mean, if you want to go the tactical pants route, that's fine. Go all out and do BDUs. You know, do a top and bottom that's BDUs. Maybe you don't like the military. I can understand that. No big deal. But at least if you're wearing uh, something like BDUs, you're wearing something that's going to be very high quality in terms of its construction, and it's kind of made uh, to take punishment, so it'll last you a while. So I, I think it's there's a lot of value in wearing something in your training that is going to stand up to realistic martial arts punishment, at least. So functional, yeah. Yeah. Functional tradition. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with that. You can't just... I mean, you can train in whatever you have, right? It's one of those things I would say, like, if you if you have someone who's willing to teach you and you just can't afford any type of specific training clothes, you can go and train what you have. But certainly, if, uh, if that's not your situation, you need to be dressed appropriate. So a uh, tangent to this one, though, what, what do you think about the belt, traditional martial arts belt? Um, well, you know, we talked last time about what a black belt means, and we both – very much established that we we feel at least a level of sentimentality uh, towards the tradition of the black belt. But, you know, here's an interesting thing is the the OB as it is actually has utility in training that most students are unaware of and actually most instructors are unaware of. So um, I would say, quite honestly, if if you don't know why you're wearing it, then there's no real reason to wear it. Um, again, like a uniform, you're not going to walk around with your black belt on or your blue belt on or your purple belt on or, or whatever, more than likely. Um, so, you know, it it does it, it serves a great function within the classroom, but is it in any way, shape or form really have any relation? I mean, okay. Even in our curriculum, we've got belt grabs, right? We've got actual self-defense techniques against belt grabs and what i explain to students is 
the belt grab is you got to look at it from the right context. I mean, somebody's not going to grab your martial arts belt out on the street. It's we're simulating something else. Somebody's grabbed a hold of the front of your shirt, or they've grabbed a hold of the the front of your pants. You know, whoa, and. Students always ask, well, why would somebody do that? I don't know. I, it doesn't matter why. What matters yeah, is that if it happen, has right. happened, you know, stop caring about why they're doing it and start focusing on if if somebody happens to do it, then know how to deal with it. Is it unlikely? Sure. It's just as unlikely as somebody doing a cross side inverted wrist grab. People don't usually grab each other like that. However, we do have one or two of those that we teach and we only teach one or two of them because that's all you need to know. It's not like when somebody throws a punch at you and you should know 20 different ways to deal with a punch. It's a good couple of good examples there of, you know, uh, the difference between techniques and principles and tactics and strategies, right. That you're learning throughout your martial arts career. And I guarantee you, Listeners, we will talk about that in another episode. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, I guess I'm looking at belts from a whole different uh, a whole different standpoint than just even the utility in the martial arts. I think, you know, again, most martial arts training programs in, in America today, anyway, be commercially oriented. Um, and a lot of society being reward driven, you know, I, I think the belt has an important aspect in that, right? I mean, it gives you something as a student to strive for, right? Yeah. Um, you know, what, what interesting thing is the first system I studied seriously, you know, uh, like Jiu Jitsu, they, they maintained a much older tradition with belts. Everybody was a white belt until basically you were a black belt. Our, our particular system did have one or two brown belts, but you know, you, you look down the line of people and, you know, literally everyone's wearing a white belt. And, uh, you know, there are, there were grades, there were seven or eight, uh, you know, grades to get to black belt, but you couldn't tell by looking at the student to do that. Right. And that is right. rooted, that is rooted in tradition. You know, you go back to the old, martial arts, uh, you know, movies and stuff where, you know, like the, uh, the rival clans send their, uh, you know, best student over to the next clan school to challenge someone, right? And kind of gave the instructors a way to like, you know, gauge who this guy is and send a student to him. And no one really knew how well trained either person was right so it kind of like was this little cat and mouse game about what our systems really do and which one's really better than the next i thought that was an interesting piece of history that i learned while, while studying um that art well but you know that, even e right. even just going with what you're saying there as a as a martial arts enthusiast um you'll get different opinions from different um, different teachers, if you go and show up to somebody else's school um, on what is the proper protocol, how do you show up? Do you show up wearing your official rank? Do you show up with no rank? Do you, you know what I mean? And different instructors, there's no universal answer. Some people will tell you, uh, if you're a black belt, you're a black belt. So you walk into that school and you wear a black belt. And other people will tell you, well, that is a huge sign of disrespect. Um, and um, yes. it's not something there's a universal answer to. Yeah, I, I don't have. Uh, have you ever been in that situation? What did you decide to do? Oh, I've been in that situation several times, and uh, what, what I usually do is when I pack my stuff, I I I pack my belt, um, and I'm also prepared to walk in and wear no belt. Mm -hmm. um, I'm perfectly fine with walking in and wearing no belt. Um, so if if the instructor crooks an eyebrow at me like, "Where's your belt?" then I can put my belt on. You know what I mean? Um, that's that's easy, and I don't mind checking my ego at the door like that. But um, if if I don't have that kind of shorthand already established with the instructor, I'll walk in with no belt on and have, you know, my actual rank in my in my duffel bag, so that if he's like, "What are you doing? Put your belt on," then I'll I'll go put my belt on. But I think that's a nice way to make sure I don't really offend anybody. Yeah, um, I uh, I always wear a white belt when I when I go into someone else's dojo if I'm, I'm going to train. 
I don't know why I decided to do that, but I always just felt like that, that is the rank that I hold in their system. So that's how I want to represent myself to them. And yeah, I think I, doing the same thing with she's she's taking the a weapons program at a, a local school that's not ours here, and uh, she's doing this. I I think it's always good to err on the side of caution when it comes to potentially offending somebody who you are expecting to be able to teach you something. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, like, if you would consider ego a, a martial arts tradition, uh, but certainly <laughs> it has been uh, a big part of martial arts history forever, right? So uh, maybe we should leave that one chalked up to another show. But, yeah, it's a good time to that's a good time to leave your ego at the door. And I think someone might argue that against belts in general is like, you know, is there, does it set up a hierarchy that doesn't need to be there? Um, and I have seen programs where it's like that, right? Where the level of respect you receive as a student from the other students appears to correlate to how high up the belt chain you've made it. And that, right. that is not a, function of the belt system that is a function of the instructor and how they run the class so 100 percent. that yeah. that comes from that comes from the top if you if you have uh and it actually i think that probably leads into one of the other ones we we discussed for today which is kind of the idea of the uh the the cult of personality in the school you know do, do you're you're expected to do things for your instructor or you should be uh, taking care of things for your instructor, or do them favors and things like that. And that's one that can really get abused a lot. Um, you know, the uh, um, back in the old days um, at uh, my uh, Kung Fu teacher's school uh, up in, in uh, you know, 50th and, and, and Maple up in Benson, um, part of the training was the students were expected to help keep the school clean. That was an understanding once a month. I think on, if I remember correctly, once a month on Saturdays, um, everybody was expected to clean. You, 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 you did some little chore that was a part of maintaining the school. Um, and that was just an expectation. And that is a, um, a huge tradition, at least in Japan, uh, to this day. Um, and it's, it's not meant as, uh, a, a method of, of slavery. It's meant to be, a, a, an act of humility is what it's supposed to be. That's the whole point of the, of the tradition of that is it's supposed to keep you, the student humble, um, and make sure that you remember that you're a part of, of this, collective so you should help take care of the collective it's it was it's not supposed to be about the instructor uh in that case but nowadays you see a whole lot of cult of personality stuff with with instructors and kind of what they may expect and and things like that from their students um and that's a real dangerous quote unquote tradition to to start up yeah so where's the line right i mean like if you make an agreement um you know if, if your students know what to expect when they sign up right um just like you said you know hey this is what you pay these are the class time twice a week forever there's testing fees there's whatever fees set that all up up front they know that and part of it is you know once a month on saturdays we clean the dojo or whatever that right seems fine to me right i think where, where do you draw the line though, right? Like I, I can think of uh, a friend of mine. Well, I think you met her once or twice. Uh, uh, she'll remain nameless. But anyway, um, she had an instructor who like the, the, the service aspect of being a martial arts student seemed to pop up conveniently when he had like home improvement projects going on and stuff. Like, you know, oh, it's uh, your, your testing is going to be next month and you have to have, you know, four hours of uh, service time. And, and by the way, I'm, you know, pulling the carpet out of my basement. So I can come over on Saturday. Yeah, that's the disgusting. Out of my basement while I watch, while I watch the, uh, sorry, I'm trying to keep this as anonymous as possible. While I watch the college football game, 
on, uh, you know, on TV upstairs, right? I mean, that's, to me, that's clearly over the line, right? There's no place for that anymore. I mean, people are paying you money to train in your program if you run a commercial school. This well, let, 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 let me balance that one with a, a question. Let's be, because I think you're making a really good point and, and, Here's here. Do you remember when we moved from the old school to the new school, you know, like all the way back in 2005? So we're talking 15 years ago. But that first like week, um, week or two was a little rough as we were getting everything all set up in the school. Still, we were teaching classes, but there was still stuff that was getting clean and stuff like that. There was a night that after the end of classes, we rounded up everybody who was in the adult class and we all went and back and cleaned mats uh, in one of the classrooms because there was, unfortunately, there was drywall um, uh, joint compound dust in the mats. And you know how those mats have texture. So um, we were just, everybody got down on their hands and knees to scrub mats. And it was a like maybe eight to 10 students and, and everybody did it. Well, a mom pulled her, 16 17 year old daughter out of the program because we did that oh. um yeah seriously um and i was kind of like what the hell is the matter with you uh that you have a problem with the fact that you know your your kid um was a, a part of this or, uh, organization has been a part of this organization and for 10 minutes we asked them to pitch in to assist everybody we didn't do it as a punishment um, there was, you know, no, no abuse going on and, and it wasn't like they were sent back to do it by themselves. They did it as part of a team with, with their instructor, you know what I mean? And I'm like, wow, you, you've got a really pampered life. If you have a problem with your kid learning to roll up their sleeves and fricking scrub a floor, you know? Yeah. I mean, people are going to draw that line and draw line in different places, right? I mean, yeah. That's, you know they were going to directly benefit from the fruits of their labor there, right? A cleaner mat on the floor that they train on, right? I mean, yeah. you could argue that they're paying a good fee and the, the school owners should take care of that themselves, but you know, there, there has to be a balance in there too. I mean, most, most martial arts school owners aren't wealthy people, you know what I mean? Uh, most yeah. martial arts schools are, like most small businesses, they kind of get by. Right. Right. There's a few that are very successful and guys get wealthy doing them, but that's, uh, that's rare. So they, they, they do need some help. I think it's just how it comes down to how do you structure that, right? Yeah. How do you make it about, uh, like you said, about the collective more than about the instructor? Yeah. Well, you know, it, uh, getting back to the to the idea, any, any favor that you do like that for your instructor, sure as hell isn't. It isn't directly benefiting you in any way, shape, or form that is going to help help you survive a self defense situation. So it's got nothing to do with that, right? Right. Exactly. Yeah. You're, um, you know, you're you're doing it for uh, sociological reasons other than. For, for the community that you, that small training community. I don't know that one. I think, uh, I think we really, we, we should line up an episode on uh, ego and how it can make martial arts, particularly self-defense related martial arts go bad. So I think that that is where Gross. this tradition goes bad. Right. Yeah. When Gross. Just, uh, just take it too far. Oh yeah. Um, how do you feel, Brian, about um, inner door or inner circle student concepts? The 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 whole um, secretive side of the martial arts. How do you feel about that? Oh yeah. So another. So one of the jujitsu system I trained in definitely kept secrets. Right. There were techniques that they would not show uh, in a room that had anybody who was less than a black belt. Um, There were also like, there were also these weird rules about like, like we did stuff in in sets of 10, right? Like we had Ikkyo, the first joint lock, right? There were 10 of them, you know, 10 different entries into the thing. 
all yeah. different punches and grabs and just kind of you learned all of them at the same time, right? Um, we would never show more than eight if we were training in a place where the public could view, right? Okay. So, like, even a white belt technique, right? Like, you come in and we're working on EQO, you know, and a class full of white belts, and, like, someone is watching who's considering joining the program. We would only show eight. You can't see all ten until you're part of the program. Oh, right? Okay. And again, I, I, this was all rooted in that tradition we kind of touched on before of like, you know, needing to keep a competitive advantage over some rival clan somewhere, right? Yeah. Uh, the, whole, the, the, the whole my kung fu is better than your kung fu. Yeah, exactly. Uh, to me, I mean, where I'm at in my training program, I see no value in that at all. I mean, go on we got youtube today right i mean like go, go out and you can find everybody's martial arts stuff everywhere out there i don't i don't think there are very many secrets like that anymore um i also think you know the way i teach my program like i i, I pick a topic at the beginning of class and we're going to cover it and sometimes it's very basic and sometimes it's very advanced it doesn't matter who's in my class that's what we're working Right. So waiting, you know, making someone wait, like, okay, George is black belt, so we can work on this technique, but you're only a blue belt, so you got to work on this other thing. I don't think it does the students uh, any type of service at all. I think you just have to be on your game in terms of how you're going to present that material to someone who's less advanced in the system. I think you, if, you, if you do a good job with that, you'll find most people handle it. Um, so yeah, for me, secrets, no good, not a good reason for them anymore. I, I don't keep secrets, but I do kind of have an order of operations and how I maybe critique a technique and how, how hard I try to refine it for somebody just because of the simple fact of after, um, so long of teaching martial arts, I I have a really good idea of the level of effort that the average student is willing to put into refining something. And I also have a really good idea of how quickly they will comprehend something. So I, I tend to disseminate information in a particular pattern, which is going to be most beneficial to where the student is at in their particular training. And it's not so much a secret as, wow, you're only a white belt and I already know where your mentality is. So I'm going to give you the information that's going to make sense and that you'll actually take and use. As opposed to telling you a bunch of things that you're going to kind of have your eyes glaze over and you're not going to understand or you're just not going to be interested in spending the time on. Um, and uh, the students who, as they continue on and they continue on, eventually they'll get all, all of the answers to all the questions that I have. Um, and uh, I'm happy to give it to them. It's just a matter of, of time and, and it being clear to me that there's comprehension uh, there and that there's also enthusiasm there. Um, so it's I don't have any secrets um, that I can think of. Um, if, I, if something is a secret in, in my school, it's a secret to me too. Um, <laughs> I, yeah. I can't think of something that like I intentionally hide from anybody. I try to be very, what you see is what you get, uh, regardless of who the student is or anything. And just, I, I try to, you know, like, okay, sometimes, uh, you and I have both been teaching for a long time and sometimes, uh, a, a junior instructor will be trying to show a student something and I'll hang back and I'll watch. And I understand that the student is struggling with what the, um, what the un instructor is trying to get across to them is because the instructors picked the wrong thing to correct. Um, they've, um, um, somebody put it to me as, as triage, right? What do you, what do you want to do when you go into the emergency room? You, you look at the emergency room at, at the, a quick diagnostic of all the patients and the first person that you help in the emergency room is the person who is in the worst trouble that can still be saved, right? If you were to do like battlefield uh, uh, triage, if you walk in and somebody has a, a really bad gunshot wound and you know they're not going to make it, you don't make that person the priority. 
because you already know they're not going to make it. But the guy who's next to him who has a almost as bad of gunshot wound that you know you can save, you go to him, right? Right. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. All right. There's things you right. Fix the first thing first, right? Is another way yeah. I've heard that word, right? Yeah. You know, you just gotta you gotta get to the to the thing that will actually benefit the student with where they're at, and sometimes instructors just are nitpicking the wrong thing. Um, so that's what I would say. It's, it's not so yeah. much that I keep secrets. I just I try to make sure there's a good orderly method of of actually trying to help them diagnose what their what their current um, challenge is. Yeah, so I think like we're touching on different reasons why systems may keep a secret, right? Like that system I mentioned before. Yeah, was worried about uh, you know who's kung fu is better than who's. Uh, <laughs> you know, you also have to worry about what is a student ready to learn. Um, yeah, and I think that's again, like you said, more about how you present stuff. I, I think there's another aspect that, that's like. You know, you're trying to keep, like, you want to keep people interested, just like we talked about with the belts, right? Like, you're a white belt, and then you get a yellow belt, and that's pretty exciting. And then it's just, you know, a short while later, you can be a gold belt or whatever color system you're using. You're just, you keep, there's always these little milestones that you can keep moving. I think a lot of people, uh, maybe I shouldn't say a lot of people, I know that some places kind of put their black belts on display, right? Like, that side of the class, you know, all we all line up in rank order and the black belts train over there and the white belts train over there. Look at the cool stuff they're doing down there. And don't you want to get there someday? Like just keep coming. And then you can do that stuff, you know, at some point in the future, right? Right. So it becomes a way to like kind of like the carrot on the end of the stick, right? Like you're, you know, you're like, oh, keep coming, keep coming to class, you know, keep renewing your contract, you know, it's, and be here. You know? It's like it's like upselling. Actually, to a certain extent, I, I had a situation like that tonight. I wasn't like putting them on display, but got two instructors on the floor. So we split. I'm working with my black belt students and Tam's working with the color belt students. And, um, you know, I've got the black belts doing black belt things. I've got them doing their curriculum, especially because very often they suffer um, a a, a, a certain lack of ability to focus on their elements because they give up some time to help other students and things like that. And here's a great opportunity for them to just work on their stuff. So we did some training with the staff and we did some very specific bag drills that were a little bit more combat oriented in, in nature as opposed to just hitting a a heavy bag. And, you know, there was some tactical knowledge that went along with the technique and not just kick the bag or punch the bag. It was, this is why I want you to do this. And, um, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, but you wouldn't stop, or I guess would ask, would you stop a colored belt student from working on a, if you were working on a scenario for your class, say, right, like this kind of attack or whatever, and that's in your black belt curriculum, would you stop a colored belt student from working on that technique? Only if, only if it was very evident that they were getting frustrated or they were doing it in a way that was proving to be potentially dangerous. Um I wouldn't, I wouldn't stop them on principle. Um, it would be more of a matter of if, if my observation of what was going on was this is heading in an unsafe direction and somebody is going to get hurt. Uh, or if it seemed to me that the student was maybe getting really discouraged because it was so above and beyond where they were at, then I would probably take that same skill and I would... I'd break it down a little bit lower into, well, here's how you can get like the first two steps of this. Don't worry about step three, four, and five, but let's work on just step one and two and we'll get that first part. And then another time we'll add in step three and step four. Yeah. See, I tend to find that like, I I don't want to keep the concepts from them at any level. Agreed. And and so I guess maybe that's kind of how I'm, interpreting this question is what am I going to keep secret, right? And it really, it's the concepts that you need to learn and understand and be able to apply, right? So do I want to, I want to introduce that. I don't tend to be the opposite, actually. I want to introduce as many concepts, however advanced they might be, as early as possible, because some of these things take a while to internalize, right? So I agree with that statement 100%. When it comes to the stuff that is principle-based and the stuff that is, is strategic in nature and principle in nature. Those are the things that 
I care about the student understanding more than actually the technical aspect because technique will come through time if they understand the principles. So um, let's segue that into one that that's interesting to me um, is kata, right? Ah, I was waiting for that one. Yeah, I. Um, so, so I. I got I'll a be, lot to say on this. Yeah, I, I, you know, I'll tell. I'll be completely honest with everybody. I don't think I know a single martial arts kata. I'm in fact, if I ever knew one, I have completely flushed it from memory. Um, yeah, to me, uh, they're, they're not in the programs that I've studied. I just don't, uh, I don't say they're value less. Um, I don't know that they technically qualify as a martial arts tradition, but, um, I think they're overused in self-defense systems. I think they're used as a, I think sometimes they're used as a way to uh, convince students they're working on self-defense type of things, even though they're really I like how you put that. I think that was very even keeled uh, in terms of an assessment. Um, and obviously, uh, I've been doing uh, kata the entirety of my martial arts training. I started in Taekwondo, so... Um, you know, I love to throw out to students that I, I still to this day, I, I still teach it, but I I went a good probably 15 years without practicing the first kata that I ever learned. But it's that simple and that so ingrained that you could wake me up out of a dead sleep at three o'clock in the morning and scream at me to do Taikyoko Shodan and I could do it flawlessly, or at least as flawless as you know, a human being is possible of. The stance would be there, the strike would be there, the block would be there, the turn would be there. Um, and, you know, I actually really love kata. I love I love kata in, in many different aspects, but I'm a huge, huge nerd about this stuff. So I'm in a state at this point in time in my life where I actually like to research kata um, <laughs> in, in, in like the same way that you might do Bible study. Um so I uh, the 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 thing that most people don't understand about kata, okay, and here's here's the problem with it where where people really kind of lose it is they they look at kata and they automatically assume because they don't understand it that there's nothing of value that's being taught in there, and that's arrogant as all get out. Um, that is a such an arrogant statement to look at something that's been passed down for. Um, anywhere from 50 to 60 years to three to 400 years and, and say, well, there's no value in that. No, no, no. You're just not patient enough to figure out what the value is. Let's, let's call a spade a spade. Um, the other problem is, is that many of the uh, kata have been changed so much over the years, uh, specifically because of competition. Um, and and what has happened to the martial arts in sportifying it in about the last 120 years um, that that's had a huge impact on kata um, but the fact of the matter is um, most martial arts instructors who are teaching kata teach it as um, they the it's like having an A section of your curriculum and a B section of your curriculum and a C section of your curriculum and A, B, and C only marginally relate to each other, if at all. Um, and that's where kata becomes a problem because it, com it becomes wasteful because it becomes an exercise where the only point of the kata is to do the kata. Um, and that's really superfluous training. I mean, it's, it's completely w worthless to the self-defense practitioner um, unless that kata is something that... A, the instructor, and B, the student, actually understand what's going on in it. Um, unless you have a clear-cut understanding and definition of, this is what I'm doing in this kata, then it's worthless, it's superfluous, at least in terms of that context of the self-defense practitioner. Because if you don't know what you're practicing, then why are you doing it? Um, it's fine as an exercise, it's fine as a performance art, uh, but not for self-defense. Um, and if you want to look at it kind of in a, in a reverse engineering standpoint, 
I'm at the point in my life where when I look at a kata, I'm, I'm actively trying to figure out what were they thinking? What was the mm-hmm. point of doing this? But, you know, you go to an, a martial art like karate or taekwondo or kung fu that are, you know, essentially kata based. And most instructors are teaching the kata to teach the kata. But the actual point of kata was to give you a a set routine to practice after you already understood the applications, not before, right? It was a, it was, it was an ability to go, okay, cool. You already know how to use these techniques. Uh, and you not only know how to do the techniques, but you know why you're doing them. You understand the application. This is a routine for you to practice those techniques when you don't have a partner. And that was the point of kata. It was, it was supposed to be kind of the, the culmination of this system is, okay, we've taught you these 30 different uh, self-defense techniques. You know, it'd be like taking combat hapkido, which doesn't have any kata. Um, and we have between the white belt all the way up to the first degree black belt, you have roughly 300 techniques. Um, if you count the break falling, if you count the striking and kicking, if you count every, every individual piece of the curriculum is about 300 techniques. But if you look at it from a really different lens, um, it's more like we have about 60 to 70 techniques that we do a crap ton of variations on. Right. Um, that's the truth of the system. Yeah. We, you can say there's 300 maybe, techniques. Maybe even less than that. Yeah, but <laughs> but it's really, you know, we have got eight core joint locks and then a few miscellaneous joint locks besides that. We've got, you know, like a, a dozen strikes and maybe like eight to ten kicks that we do. Um, and then everything is different ways of combining those and, and different variations on them is really what the system is. So... Um, you, you, could I write a kata for combat hop keto? You're damn right. I could, I, uh, actually have, if, if there was a, if grandmaster Pellegrini said, you know what, we're going to systemize uh, a, a kata, I'd be oh, like, I'm on oh, it. Please. No, 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 no. I wouldn't even <laughs> offer it. I, w- I wouldn't even offer it. But if he said to me, I want to do this, I would volunteer. I'd go, let me, please let me do it. Um, but, um, that that's what the point of kata is is it's supposed to be a a secondary training routine so that you can practice specific elements of a technique if you and i get together and we work on as an example if we work on a a kodagaishi um or an outside lead right just to throw in yeah. some jargon out there for, to make sure we hit as much of the audience as possible um you and i can do that back and forth with each other However, we've got to practice in a specific method because I don't want to break your wrist. You don't want to break my wrist. And there's got to be some agreed upon things. Whereas if I understand what the pantomime of uh, of a outside wrist twist or, or a kodagaishi, however you want to put it, is, then I can practice that full speed, full power, full intent by myself as much as I want. Um, and the idea would be to put both of those into effect so that they support each other in training. So, um, you know, and, and Kata in and of itself is, is a mnemonic device as well. It's for, it's for helping memorize things and, and passing things down in oral tradition. But now we have books, now we have DVDs, now we have YouTube. Um, and so is it, is it really helpful to the self-defense practitioner? I don't think so. Um, I love to do them because I love to do them. Right. Um, but to be perfectly honest, from a self-defense practitioner standpoint, you never I mean, look at you. Right. You don't you don't know any. Um, you're no less effective in your martial arts training than I am in any way, shape or form. So right. there's there's no case to saying you got to do this for your self-defense at all. Yeah, I, I, I'm just, you know, give it the old 86 for me and it just doesn't doesn't need to be there. I do see the value, like you said, and, and like, it's something you can practice at home. And that, that may be, you know, one of the downsides of the system that we both study as our primary system is you really need a partner to study it the way that we teach it, right? It's hard to go home and practice. You can do strikes and whatnot, but 
that's about it. Um, Brian, but, I'm going to tell you flat out, my Combat Hub Keto students who were who were serious, the real hardcore ones, asked to learn kata over the last couple of months. So they can practice at home. Yeah, uh, I, students, I don't. I don't. I students ask how they can practice at home. Yeah, I didn't yeah. make anybody do it, but you know, I as I was teaching, like on Saturdays, teaching my Taekwondo students, some of my black belts and some of my more advanced uh, Combat Hub Keto students who were very serious are like, can can you? Be, and there's a good reason for that. It's because a lot of those uh, techniques that I teach in kata, I actually know the breakdown for. I know the actual. This is what the self-defense aspect is. This is how you use it. And, you know, the, the truth is when you look at, at, at Kata, it's not um, what you see in, in, in terms of, you know, um, jump front kick somebody and do a big old block. And, right. you know, Kata for the most part are, are way more like what we do in terms of break somebody's balance and manipulate their arm into a, a, an arm bar. And it doesn't look like that when there's no other human being in there, but you, when you watch somebody do a, a segment and it looks really beautiful, it looks like one thing until you put another human being in between their arms. And then you go, Oh wow, that's an yeah. arm bar. And, and that, that is just missing from most instructors presentation of Kata. Right. I mean, I look at my daughter, she's in, in a program here and the school, I, I think it's, it's, you know, a pretty good school. I don't want to put down the school that she's in it. Think it's a good school otherwise she wouldn't be there but like she's in the youth program and you know she's got like a form that's i can't remember what it is 172 steps long and like it's a great memory exercise but yeah, it's probably yeah. very useless yeah and you know they're like oh it's like it, it, you know, it's a multiple attacker scenario and all this stuff it just it's it's missing the point it, it's teaching something else it's teaching them how to you know, learn a complex sequence of events. It's not right. teaching them how to do self defense, right? And right. Kata's for, never Kata's never more than than one attacker. Right. It's never more than one attacker. It's always one attack. At least at least in the traditional sense. Anything that was anything that was written before the twentieth century, yeah. it's all one attacker. There's right. never multiple attackers. I think uh, you know again. I don't know how much more we need to say about, or how much more I have to say about this one, but I, I just uh, think they're, they're, if you have a system that doesn't have, you know, if you have a self-defense system that has them, you just need to be careful about how they're presented, like you were discussing before, how much of the pie is that, right? Um, yeah. If it's too much, you, you're probably learning the wrong stuff. If, if you go to a system that doesn't have any at all, um, my opinion, that's actually better because you're going to be spending more time learning the concepts with a partner, the timing, the speed, the distancing, all that stuff that I kind of will let you down on. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you can't do self-defense practicing. You, you can't learn to actually be effective with it if you don't do it on a human being. So if you spend hours upon hours on, on kata, you're kind of missing the point of self-defense. You got to put another human being in there. Yeah. I yeah. agree. You had another one in here. I'd like to. I'd like to touch on in a few minutes here. Uh, the military influences in the martial arts. Modern military. Martial arts. What, what, where are you coming from with that? Well, when you think about martial arts in in terms of how it has boomed in the West, it's completely directly related to World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and all of those engagements, right? Um, it, it's 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 been booms in terms of post World War II um, is when you started to see people coming home from uh japan with uh knowledge of karate and judo and things like that right um and then same thing when it comes to like post korean war and post vietnam war and things like that so uh the what happens is in at least those arts uh history has been a whole lot of direct military influence in terms of um you know, the Imperial Japanese Army, the Republic of Korea Army, um, a lot of, of those internalized the martial arts as part of their training regimen. Um, so there became a level of influence on that. But then there's a secondary one, which is the Western um, 
societies, militaries were the people who picked up those things and brought them back. So it's Marines who were um, stationed uh, overseas in Japan uh, post World War Two who who brought that stuff back. It's you know soldiers who were um, in stationed in Vietnam who worked hand in hand with you know Republic of Korea soldiers. Um, who came back with Taekwondo and, and Hapkido and things like that. So there's a lot of things we do in the martial arts that is very obviously, um, it is, uh, it is soldiers, Marines, uh, uh, sailors, mm-hmm. airmen who came home and they're the ones who taught it. And so we, uh, we teach a lot of those things one way. And then if you were to go to, um, Okinawa and train in a, in a standard dojo in Okinawa, those things will be missing. If you go to China and you train in a, in a Chinese martial arts school, those things will be missing. They just, a lot of those things that we do, like the way we line up, the way we bow, uh, the way that we kind of salute and all those, uh, those kinds of elements attention and bow. And, you know, that's, that's all military tradition. That's not really, um, an aspect of, how martial arts were created. If you go to an Okinawan dojo, that stuff is going to be very, very, very few and far between. You can go and train in karate in, in a school in Okinawa, and none of that stuff will be there, um, unless it's actually a Japanese karate system. And there is a difference between uh, Okinawan karate and Japanese karate because it's kind of, you know, one is a r- removed from its parent and got japanified if you will right and so the the okinawans don't train in karate the way the japanese do there's a huge difference between the two of them yeah i mean i think every martial arts system in the world um has been localized you know Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. it's just the way it goes right i mean sometimes it's just about physicality right i mean like you know different people from different regions of the world have different you know, average heights or lengths of arms and legs, and it lends themselves better to certain types of techniques than other types of techniques. You know, clothing that they wear, maybe the climate that they live in, all of that stuff. You need, yeah. you know, you need to tailor the techniques you're doing to your environment, right? So, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, what, what, what do you commonly do in the martial arts? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Right. Uh, those that's that's not Okinawan karate. That's Western influence is what that is. That's you know that got that that got brought to commercial martial arts via the military base is where that came in. You know, that's not that's not because it was there from the beginning. See what I was thinking about when you brought this topic up was like rules of engagement, right? Like what is the situation in which you're applying these skills and certainly. That's very different if you're talking about a military background than if you're talking about the average civilian life. And, uh, and that's a huge difference. Yeah, and that's probably another entire show that we could do. Uh, there's a lot of ground to cover there. I, I have seen some things um, that people get taught. You know, that, that civilians like us are taught that are just like, God, you're making a monster. You know what I mean? So. Yeah. Well, you know, let, let's just throw one out there. You know, every every decade has its martial arts fad. Okay. For those that, that maybe don't realize this, you do this long enough. Every decade has one or two martial arts that become the new big bad kid on the block. Like nowadays, it's Krav Maga, right? Um, yeah. That would be the and uh, Krav Maga, of course, uh, comes from uh, Israel and was a martial art created by the military. Um, and so it is um, it is very much intended for battlefield use and close quarters combat in real um, actual combative situations. So it's no fuss, no must, no nonsense. And teaching that to a civilian um, can uh, be very effective, but it also could really easily end up with you in the courtroom. Um, so that'll be something we'll talk about in the future in terms of this podcast is, is how do you balance your techniques? Not only so that you can be effective, uh, and go home at the end of, of the fight, but you also don't end up in jail. 
Yeah, absolutely true. I think, you know, one of my previous instructors, you know, he put it, put it in a way that stuck with me, you know, like the, the ancient, you know, the martial arts came from ancient times when, you know, this is how they fought wars, right? I mean, with swords and sticks and bare hands and stuff like that, right? And, you know, some of these techniques, I mean, the human body is the same as now as it was back then for the most part, right? Right. It might be taller or something, but, you know, the joints all work the same way, right? So some of these techniques have been around for hundreds or arguably thousands of years, right? And, you know, he, he, he said at one point in time, he's like, if you're struggling with the technique, tell me you're struggling with the technique, but don't tell me it didn't work. Right. People, you know, <laughs> it works. literally people died to prove that these techniques work. The only ones that survived history are the ones that worked because everybody who tried the ones who didn't work died on the battlefield. Right. Right. So yeah. you have to respect, well, you have to respect that aspect of tradition. But the thing that it comes back to is, is how do we apply these techniques in modern society? And that's where I think these traditional influences can kind of screw you up if you're not careful. Just the Krav Maga example you gave was was a perfect one. Yeah. If, if well, the only you, time you're going to use this is on an open battlefield when it's him or you, then you do what you got to do, right? Yeah. But when somebody's you know pushes you in the parking lot, just they think they you cut them off with your car and. The only response you have is the full force solution. I guess who's in the wrong, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, and um, the uh, um, the interesting thing when when you start looking at at all those aspects is you, you can go out on YouTube. And, I mean, anytime you can find anything you want to know about the martial arts on YouTube. And one of my favorite things to point out to students when it comes to the internet is any idiot can post on the internet. OK, I mean, right. no offense, no this answer. this this might be proof of it right here, right. quite honestly. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it doesn't take a lot of skill. It doesn't take a lot of money. It doesn't take a lot of experience to post on the Internet. You know, so anybody who's listening out there, if you think I'm an idiot, you might very well be right. OK, but it's it's this simple. Uh, if you had to uh, 40 years ago, if you were writing a book, then um, somebody put some money Right. Somebody put some money down to have that book published, whereas I can write an ebook tonight and post it for free on the Internet and anybody can have it. And it doesn't make me an expert. Um, you know what I mean? So there's a great video on YouTube of some guy who's debunking joint locks. The only problem is that anybody who actually knows how to perform the joint locks can look and go clearly. This guy doesn't actually understand how they're done to begin with. You know, if, if you don't know the mechanics of how the technique is, is working and you're doing it wrong and you're having the person who is doing them to you is doing them wrong, well, then, of course, you can easily de debunk these yeah. techniques. But, you, you, you know, get... get Oh, Go ahead. Sorry, step on you. You see a lot, a lot with pressure points too. People yeah. on both sides of that argument. They're the best thing since sliced bread. To they, they, they're not even a thing at all, right? Right. It really comes down to: Do you understand what you're doing, and then the situation in which they can be used effectively? Right. So. Right. Yeah, you got to understand the technique well enough to use it, and B, you have to know the right time to use it. All right. Well, we could go on on this topic forever. Maybe we'll do a, sh a part two of, part two. of uh, martial arts tradition at some point in the future. But for now, I think we're going to wrap this one up. Um, thanks again, everyone who's listening or watching for uh, participating with us. If you think we're idiots, please like the video. If you think we're not idiots, please also like the video. Uh, whatever you can do helps us out. Leave a comment, star, whatever system is in front of you, please do it for us to help us get a little bit of uh, promotion going on. If you like, if you think we're idiots, like the video. But if you don't think we're idiots, please share the video so other people know that we're not idiots. You could share the video even if you do think we're idiots. You could tell all your friends to come and watch these videos. But <laughs> it's, uh, it's the old attitude. Uh, no, uh, no press is bad press, right? Um, we're also not ashamed uh, uh, to uh, make fools of ourselves. So yes. bring it on. Um, so again, we're uh, always looking for questions or comments, um, topics you'd like to see us discuss in the future. Please leave those for us. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll try and work them in. 
Uh, and with that, we will see you next time when our uh, discussion will center around um, strategy versus tactics versus principles versus techniques. Uh, what, how do all these things fit together to make commercial systems? It's going to be good. Take care, everybody. All right. Thanks.